Hello there, sword friends. Today I am going to make a list, a series of lists around katanas, because goddammit, people have asked me to do it a lot, so I'm just, I'm just gonna make one. A couple caveats before we start. I don't like lists. They don't include context. There's a lot of arguments that could be had around either one of these. Um, that's why I'm begrudging making a list, but enough, enough folks want one, so damn it, I'm gonna do it. Uh, this list, or a series of lists, will be katana-related. Uh, if you want me to make a European-style one later, then maybe I will, but I don't think anyone comes to me for advice on that stuff. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna talk about katanas. I'm also gonna try and restrict these, kind of, my favorites, or top threes. Let's stick to threes. Uh, in, in the sense of swords that I've actually handled and that theoretically are available today. Um, so that means I'm going to shy away from things that are discontinued, that I've really liked, because you might not be able to go buy one. Um, though, you know, some, some pain in the ass parts might, might make their way here. And I'm going to ramble about each one of them, because that's what I can do. It's raining and miserable outside right now, and, uh, and I don't want to go play in the rain. So I'm going to make a list. That's what I'm going to do. Also, I, I should note, these are just my thoughts and comments. You are welcome to disagree with me. In fact, it's entirely more fun if you do. Uh, throw a commentary down below if you think something that I said is dumb, incorrect, or if you have a differing opinion, uh, throw it down. It makes for a great conversation. Anyway, uh, lists. Here we go. So, I'm going to start with general backyard favorites, right? When I say general backyard favorites, I mean uh, you're not a student who's trying to achieve any particular goal. You just want to have some shits and giggles in the backyard at a price that's reasonable. Say a price that's reasonable is around $300 or less. So for that, my third place victory here in terms of fun backyard cutter is a $50 Musashi. Now, I know you could spend more and get a better sword. Unquestionably, that is true. But the Musashi $50 sword offers something that a lot of other swords don't, and that is a... a thing that is disposable. A lot of people might feel pretty shitty about breaking a $300 sword, and that's inevitably what's going to happen if you whack anything into logs or in the backyard and you're not, you're not studying or cutting the appropriate medium. Medium, They will degrade or uh, diminish and, uh, and, and inevitably not be as good as they were. So some people will look at a $300 blade and not, not want to spend any more money on it, uh, not want to break it, and feel really bad if they do, if they bend it, if they chip it, if any of that kind of stuff happens. And the $50 sword is a great value where most people at that price point, I'm not trying to knock on you, $50 is a lot of money, um, but you don't feel bad if you bend it. If, if, it's, if it's something that is a uh, costs you tuition in this grand hobby of ours where you can break it and really not feel too bad about it and it gives you a chance to cut noodles to kind of feel how a sword moves to get some of the dumb decisions you might make with one out of your system whack it into a log see that it breaks and then not do that with your more expensive tools so fifty dollars is one of my favorite backyard cutters if you can buy a sword that is functional even as flawed and imperfect as it is i think that's a great sword the next one is uh, my number two spot, and that is the Hanway Raptor series blades. They've proven to be durable. I've played with them. I haven't pushed them to, to completely break, but those blades are, are pretty well regarded. They have a decent set of fittings on them. They're clunky, um, and I haven't been terribly impressed with the, the fit and finish on the handles. Those seem to come undone and be a little larger than I, I personally prefer, but the blades are great for backyard fun. They're really durable and they're, you know, they're not going to live forever chopping into logs, but they'll, they'll last quite a while. And then uh, I suppose my number one pick for backyard beating is really the Dojo Pros, and this is uh, m somewhat biased from the standpoint that I've broken so many of them. I've made a lot of videos around breaking Ronin Dojo Pros. All of the examples that I've had have been like factory seconds with some sort of flaws, and each one of them has been incredibly difficult to break. Uh, what does that mean for you? Is it the best thing for anything else? Maybe not necessarily, but if you're looking for something to start to just have fun in your backyard, uh, to cut some various mediums of the, the kind of, <laughs> what, what the nature has to offer you in your area, uh, I think they're, they're great blades. They've proven to be very, very durable, and they have flaws. I'm not going to deny that. There's some imperfections in the handles. The Ito can come loose. Um, they're not necessarily the best tool all the way around, but they have been very, very durable blades. They've held up really well, and there's a lot of different styles and things like that to choose from. So if, if people ask me, what's your kind of go-to backyard thing for under 300 bucks? I think those Dojo Pros really last quite well, and they're not grotesquely huge. Some of them can be, I mean, it depends on which one you want to get, but all of those 1060 series blades that they make uh, in the Dojo Pro line seem to hold up really, really well. Uh, <laughs> when I say really, really well, I've just been, it's been quite a chore to break them. And so that's why, I've, since I, I, I have more experience breaking those swords, that's why I say 
uh, I know what it takes to, to really put them through their paces. They've, they've proven to me that they are, are durable products, and I think that's really what's needed when you're talking about a sword for uh, people that aren't, aren't really trying to study a, a martial art. They just want a katana because they're cool as fuck and want to play with them in their backyard, and they want it to last a long time, and I think those swords do that. The Ito might come loose, but, you know, if you're not opposed to a duct tape handle and you're trying to spend under 300 bucks, I think that's that's a good place to go. They might be a little bit more than 300 bucks, but they're ballpark there. I think I see them on Cult of Athena for around that. Anyway, that's my general backyard three list. Uh, hopefully, it's it's interesting. I get a lot of questions about what's the best this, that, or the other. I, I don't know, um, but I do know that those are durable products, and I've been happy with all three of those for various reasons. Okay, the, the next series of lists that I have is really around students, right? And students, by that I mean you're, you're trying to learn a martial art that involves a katana and you want to get a tool to, to further that, uh, that goal. But the, the thing here is that you're not just doing backyard fun, you are, you are learning a uh, martial art. And so the first thing I would say is make sure you talk to your teacher. That's the first, first inevitable thing is you may have a specific set of criteria that you need to meet which nullifies anything useful about this list. But I can say that if you've talked to your teacher, nothing specific is involved then maybe these these musings will be helpful. Um, so first, let's talk about tamashigiri or uh, mat cutting. Right now, what is the budget level mat cutter that I that I think is good? Right. Uh, so if we're talking about budget mat cutters, say under five hundred dollars, and they are specifically driven towards cutting to tatami uh, mats in or some analogous substance similar to tatami mats. Number three would be the Minatoshi Performance Cutter. That sword was lent to me from Swordfriend Brian, I recall, and it was a fantastic cutter. It was flawed and imperfect. I think it was around $500. The example I had was cracked, and, and Swordfriend Brian, I believe, was able to get that sword replaced by, uh, by Sword and Armory. But it was just a really, really, really impressive cutter for the money. It was delicate, but if you deliver, if you get some experience in cutting, I thought that was an amazing level of performance for $500. Now, it's really specifically geared towards cutting tatami and not really much of anything else, but that's really what this, this is for. If you are uh, kind of intentionally trying to learn how to do tatami cutting competitively and be very good at it, you're spending a lot of money on, uh, on the tatami mats, you're spending a lot of money on the lessons, you're devoting a lot of time to it, and having a tool that's refined and does that well, uh, $500 is a pretty good value for that, in my opinion. Anyway, I recall that impressing me quite a bit. Uh, the next one is really the, the Hanwei Musashi XL. Um, this is commonly used in many a dojo. It's a very uh, popular blade and it's, I think, around $500 in most cases, but it's it's a big, meaty cutter. Hanwei makes great blades. That XL geometry or elite geometry tends to lend itself really well to being a, a Tamashigiri-style blade. By that, I mean they're, they're a little bit wider and a little thinner, and I don't know, the way the way that geometry works out, it works out well as a lawnmower. So the Musashi XL, I see a lot of people use it. I've used the Musashi XL. It's a very, very impressive cutter. Uh, it's very resilient. It's a differentially hardened blade. I don't know that you're necessarily getting into it for aesthetics at that point, but um, it's handsome for what it is. It cuts really well, and it, it abates rust and things like that. It's, it's a pretty resilient blade. But at $500, I would say my real number one here in terms of budget cutting value is the Practical XL. And I just think, as I look at a budget cutter, the, the context here is overall value. Uh, the Munitoshi Performance Cutter is a little fragile. Performance kind of, I, I thought was fantastic, but you gotta have a skill to cut with it and not damage it. The Musashi XL from Hanwei is a little more forgiving than the, the Munitoshi Performance Cutter in my mind, less fragile but still more expensive than the Practical XL, which effectively does the same thing as the Musashi XL, uh, albeit to, you know, it has less less features, doesn't come apart as easily, but overall, I mean, for 200 bucks or 200-ish dollars, I think value-wise on that sword, for an entry-level person getting into Tamashigiri, uh, it's really tough to tough to beat, especially if you need to uh, try to have something that is, is competitive and puts you in the ballpark of cutting tatami uh, well, or have a tool that's really purpose-built to do that, well, simultaneously, uh, knowing that you're probably going to fuck it up and bend it, so I, that $200 price point I think is a little bit, a little bit more forgiving, especially if you're doing this regularly. You're going to have to sharpen it. It's going to have to look ugly, and and why, why spend money on something uh, to to have it sharpened and look ugly and get bent and stuff, especially as you're as you're starting out and learning, and your angles aren't that great, and you have a lot of work to do in terms of not not breaking a sword. 
All right, so the next category is uh, bling cutters. Now, I, I'm certainly no expert in the realm of Tamashigiri. I try. I'm working at it, but I've got a long way to go before I'm any good at it. If you have a little bit more money to spend, say more than $500, then I would, I would first of all, you know, say number three would probably be a Tori XL or a customized uh, Hanwei Musashi. And when I say customized, if you're if you're doing Tamashigiri, you're drawing the blade out. How well it acts in the in the art of drawing the sword and putting it away is less important. But the fit and finish on the handle, how tight everything is, all of that can play into your comfort level and your accuracy when you're swinging that sword. So the Tori XL is a little bit more expensive, but I would honestly probably prefer a customized or kind of rehandled, a rehilted uh, Hanwei Musashi XL over a, a Tori XL. Now, I, I know I'm kind of breaking that rule there. You can't buy that off the shelf, but there are people who offer customization services that can tie Ito on in a color or some sort of customization element that you like. Also, it gives you some play with being able to move the point of balance. You can add a little weight uh, towards the, the base or, or change the hilt length, and that might marginally improve how much you, you like the sword or how well it swings for you. Uh, number two for me, if you have money, would be the Hataya Kitetsu blades. Those are sold from Nihonzashi. I've reviewed uh, them or talked about them before. They're just delicate. They bend relatively easily in my experience. Um, it could be just because I'm a bad cutter, but it seems like uh, many of the blades that I've seen just need to need to they're a little soft. They're forgiving. They don't break, which is good, and they can be straightened out and used again and sharpened, and they are amazing cutters, but at the same time, uh, they're just a little little less forgiving of, of people at my level of or aptitude of cutting. And if you have the money, the Evolution Blades, the Motohara Blades, I've reviewed uh, the, the LMC that I have, which is the first generation. It looks like they've improved uh, substantially since the, the first generation sword that I had. Now, they're pretty costly. They're more expensive, I believe, than a Hataya Kitetsu, more expensive than a customized Musashi or rehilted one. Uh, don't be surprised if you're spending $3,000 on a, on a blade from Evolution Blades, but they've proven themselves to be extremely proficient cutters, uh, and they're mounted up in such a way that the, the work is pretty much on par with any, any kind of custom work that would, that would go out there, and there's a myriad of options that are available uh, if you want something a little more bespoke to your personality. Anyway, they're, they're just very prolific cutters. They do a great job, and if you have the money, buy one. It's, it's one of my all-time favorite swords there. Now, that's cutting in terms of a student. If you're doing tatami cutting or like material cutting, if you're doing bamboo cutting, I don't really do that. I don't cut hard woods very often, so I don't have a lot of recommendations, and so I'm not going to put them on the list. But I can speak to Iaido. I do a little bit of that, or at least a try, especially now that that's about all I can do from home. Uh, so what do I like for Iaido? And Iaido, when I say that, I mean you are using the sword to draw it out of the sheath and put it back in a, in a kind of regimented, um, scripted way, and you're any, that's the Ido. You can look up what it is if you don't know. But basically, you're not cutting anything. You're cutting air. You're moving the sword around. And a lot of other little things than the steel. The steel can be made out of uh, really garbage steel, so long as the rest of the stuff fits well and is tight and, and feels right in your hand and is shaped correctly and slides in and out of the side correctly and doesn't bind. All of those little assembly things are what generally tend to get in the way of the Ido. So, uh, number three pick for Iaido. If in, this is in, there's not really any cheap sword that I found that does it particularly well. Um, all of them have small flaws, so I, I, I have no budget recommendations for Iaido. My first recommendation, or third place, call it, if we have to stick to this list format, is really the Motohara blades. Uh, they're great cutters, but the LMC blade is also light enough for me to, to move around and do Iaido. And all of those small things that I gripe about in terms of fit and finish are addressed on the Motohara pieces, and it was comfortable for me to do Iaido with. Very often, I'll now bring one blade to uh, to the dojo, where I, well, at least I did before the pandemic, and if they don't mind me using the live blade, and I'll use that for, for Iaido when we're, when we're going through it, and then I'll use it for cutting as well. Uh, formerly, I would bring um, a, a in the Ito or a, a, an aluminum non-sharpened blade because it was lighter and more comfortable to use as you're doing multiple repetitions or I would practice with it but very often I use my Motohara blade for practice now. Uh, the next one I would say is if you're doing the Ido it would be a custom mounted and I'm going to go back to this custom mount thing because really I don't know of any Chinese company um, in terms of like the mass produced mass customized things that that really nail the fit and finish in a way that's comfortable for Iaido out of the box. Every single sword that I've had, well not every single one, but the vast majority of mass production swords really miss the mark on fit and finish as it relates to practicing Japanese martial arts in my in my opinion. So I would rather have a kind of a bare blade from a company like uh, Huawei, Huawei um, uh, 
uh, or a bear blade from from take your pick um, they make decent blades in in, uh, in China they, they certainly do that well but the fit and finish level I've, I've always found to be a little bit lacking and I would send that off to to one of the various customizing services inside the US which would likely cost substantially more than the blade but the result would be I'd have something that would be a much more apt tool to, to learn uh, yeah, I do with if if that was the goal. So I'd I'd rather that, or even finding an antique on eBay. Um, if you're practicing with a sword that's very very old, I mean, ideally don't do it with something that is, you know, has has historical value. But if you're not cutting anything with it, if the idea is just to practice with air, you can still damage it, but it's it's a lot harder to do. Um, there is something fun about practicing with an antique. I've teetered on the idea for a long time of taking a sword that's about my size that I really like the weight on and mounting it up to to use for Iido because there's I don't know, there's some, some um, historical or fun factor that goes into practicing within, with a, a blade that's hundreds of years old. And if that enhances your experience, then I, I would say that that's fine. I don't know that I'd recommend doing it with Gunto or the, um, the, uh, the World War II style blades. There's a, a lot of those out there. They're not particularly light, generally speaking. They're a bit on the stouter side, and I, I can't say that I would find them as fun to practice with. But there's a lot of inexpensive antiques that have flaws that you wouldn't want to use to cut anything, but for the purposes of Iido, they're they're perfectly fine, they're light, and uh, and you're not um, you're, you're not going to cut anything with it if you're just using it for free Iido. Uh, the number one pick that I would have, though, honestly, would just be buying something nice from Tezando. They have flaws, they degrade over time, any sword does, but honestly, they, they make really great stuff, and if you're sticking specifically to any Ito, you don't want a sharp blade, you, you want something that is uh, light, that you don't have to worry about cleaning afterwards, you can kind of throw it in the bag and move on, you don't have to clean the, the steel off afterwards, um, because you, in a lot of Ito, you're touching the, the blade with your hands, and therefore you, you'd probably want to clean it or, or risk the opportunity for that blade to rust. Um, so there's something from Tizando. I have a Tizando blade, and I really, really like it. I used it extensively, and it's it's one of my favorite tools. I really do like to practice if I'm working on speed. I don't like to use a sharp sword because it's a recipe to hurt myself. I'm a big dumb man beast at times. I often flub and and miss or or you know I'll poke myself in the hand. And uh, not using a sharp blade really helps me refine technique. I need a lot more of that refinement, but I would say one of my favorite tools, and I think Tizando does a great job with fit and finish. Uh, they glide in and out of the sire right. The Ito is tight. It, it's shaped well and feels good in my hands. Um, I think I think quite highly of their work. Unfortunately, they do degrade, and especially, I mean, if you're doing Iado, you're doing a lot of repetitions. That's kind of the point of it. The, the tool eventually wears out, and you'll need a new one. So don't expect forever, but the one that I've had has lasted me at least seven years, and I got it used before then and it's it's still going still going strong though it could admittedly use a little a little love on the wrap anyway that's it for the student side of things um, I'll talk a little bit more now about agile cutters and when I say agile I mean something that's going to favor maneuverability when I talked about the uh, the LMC is a pretty maneuverable blade but it's still in a profile that is really not uh, not as light as it could be you might say and the other blades I talked about with Tama Shigiri were for cutting straw mats. And they're not really for water bottles, per se, um, and they're not necessarily agile. The Katetsu, for example, or the, the Hanway XL, those are big, meaty blades, and they're not, not exactly nimble. So if you're favoring, like, harassing cuts, you want something that moves around quite a bit better, um, then, then I can talk about my favorite agile cutters that you can buy and are available and that I've used. Now, I don't test as many of these style blades. I do get some, um, but very often I, I haven't made as many reviews about them. Um, so the, the first thing that I guess I'll say is the Ronin RK blade. I recently got one of those not too long ago, and it is a light, lively little thing, and it's really cheap. They're 150 bucks, and it feels really good in the hand, and it's sharp, and I've cut with them before, and I think basically it demonstrates a very good uh, lively, inexpensive blade if you're trying to do light cuts on water bottles and kind of backyard stuff, but you want something that's lighter and more maneuverable than uh, than the ones that are kind of dedicated toward cutting straw mats. Beyond that, I have two recommendations from Hanway, and basically number two would be the Orchid Katana. I think it moves around really well. It's a very light, fun blade. It doesn't have a bohe. Uh, it's rigid, but still at the same time, it, it's very it's very fun to move around and feels light and like you could make those harassing cuts. I think it's thicker than you would probably want to do any kind of 
tricky cutting with water bottles, but at the same time I do find it to be light and dexterous, and if your objective would be to have a sword that could do harassing cuts, to, to find gaps in, uh, in an armored opponent, in, you know, Japanese-style armor, where your wrist would be open, your armpits, uh, you know, the, the inner thighs, those, that kind of small blade lends itself to me to be thick enough to deflect things if needed, but thin enough were and agile enough that I could do those harassing cuts, and I find that uh, the Orchid to be kind of one, of one of my favorite swords for that. It's also very pretty, in my, my opinion. I like the fitting set on it. Uh, the first one, though, would be the Hanwei Shinto. My favorite was the 25th Anniversary Shinto. I thought that was a very fine moving sword, and the Shinto blades that I've had from Hanwei, they're very prolific. They've been out for a long time. I find them to be very, very comfortable swords, very akin in, in scale and shape to a Niaido, um, or any Aito, I should say, in, in terms of how light they are, and I, I think they're they're fun blades. I wouldn't want to do a lot of cutting, but I've cut pretty thick targets with the Hanwei Shinto. It still did the job, though. I would I would say they're they're probably for even lighter targets, and I would stick to pool noodles. That said, I would uh, I would say it is a very agile, fun blade to use, and kind of goes at the top of my list of of fun. Uh, nimble blades, particularly the 25th anniversary edition. For some reason, that sword uh, sits in my mind as one of the, the most fun little blades to move around that I've had. Next list, I'll say top three for all-around balanced swords without going crazy on the budget. So things that are less than, say, 700 to 800-ish dollars. I'll, you know, I'll put some less expensive one there, too. Um, but balanced on a budget. What I mean by that is it's not big and bulky, like a, a blade for Tamashigiri. Uh, it doesn't have that kind of wider blade profile, but at the same time, it's not, you know, overly light either. It's it's somewhere kind of in between. Usually these are around uh, two pounds, eight ounces to, you know, say two pounds, 11 ounces. I know that's a weird weight thing. The point of balance is, anyway, uh, the, without getting into too many weight specifics, I would say the, these swords gave me the impression that I could do Iaido with them, I could do those harassing cuts, I could cut heavy things with them, but it, it didn't strike me as purpose-built for any of those tasks, just that it would be able to operate in those spheres comfortably, um, and, and so that's when I think of a balanced sword, I think of something that I could I could achieve or act act in any of those things. I wouldn't want to do harassing cuts with a Hataya Kitetsu. It's a big four-pound sword, it's heavy to move around, it's a devastating cutter, but at the same time it doesn't really give me the impression that I would be able to... Before I was so rudely interrupted, I was basically getting to the point that the Kitetsus at four pounds don't give me the impression that I would be able to really do any kind of harassing, very nimble cuts. They're devastating cutters, and I could cleave a man in two with one, but I don't know that I could I could kind of poke at his wrist as he was as he was trying to poke me. So uh, I'm going for a balance sword, something that I could do those with that would also be an effective effective chopper. And the first one on the list is actually, I'm going to break another rule here, the Minatoshi Tessin. And I think Minatoshi kind of deserves to be on my list somewhere. They're they're an interesting company, and I've, I've liked the blades that I've had from them, and the Tessin in particular was one that strikes me as a, as a great thing. Uh, I really liked it as it's balanced, it had a lot of features, it was folded, and it was pretty, it looked like a little bit like a leprechaun, it wasn't the prettiest thing, but uh, it offered a lot of features and it felt great in my hand, and I kind of regret selling it, it was one of my, one of my favorites. Um, I don't think they sell that blade anymore, but I think they sell some things that are analogous to the Tessin. So if you can find them, I think that that really strikes me, at least enough to even break this rule, uh, to, to be on number three on the, the kind of all-around balance uh, list. The number two would be the Hanwei Bushido. I think that is a great sword. It's not, again, my favorite looks-wise, but uh, the weight, the dimensions, overall, how it performs, I think it's a fantastic sword in terms of balance. I've rambled about it on this channel before, and I think I think it... it definitely deserves a place to, to be an all-around kind of balanced player in the in the sword market and not not uh, ugly to look at it has folded steel and it's pretty just the overall dimensions of it seem to to favor just about any it doesn't favor any particular test but I, I think it would play well in any my number one pick though I think would be the sky drill warlord this blade impressed me in terms of its feature set but more the the shape it moved around it wasn't particularly light it wasn't overly heavy it cut things extremely well given the level of sharpness it had uh, and it, its overall dimension seemed to, to be kind of top. If I had to pick between the Hanwei Bushido and the Warlord, I'd probably go with the Warlord, though. Um, 
you know, they, they each uh, have a special place in my heart. But then again, I also sold both of them. <laughs> so, um, but still, the Warlord would kind of be top of my list, I think, for, for balanced swords. And now, those are, I think, the, the kind of main categories that people actually ask me about. Continuing, interesting art pieces. Uh, let's put number three spot here, starting with Jayco. Jayco Sino Swords uh, is the, the other name for it. They made me a really impressive Sanmai blade with some weird geometry and, and all sorts of stuff. Now, I've reviewed other kind of custom-made pieces, but this one stands out because, one, it was really inexpensive. It was under $300, and it had a lot of rich features in it in terms of folding and lamination and a rattan wrap scabbard and, and customized fittings and a really weird geometry and size, and all of that was, was given for a relatively inexpensive price, and it was it made for cool conversation. I could see hanging something like that on the wall and having a lot of stuff to talk about while, while being on a budget, and I thought that that was really impressive. They made good swords. I also used that sword and beat the crap out of it and eventually broke it, um, and, and it was a fine sword as well, but feature rich at a, at a budget was really what impressed me there more than anything else. Uh, dollar for feature value uh, was, was really quite high there. Uh, the number two spot I'm going to throw on the Skydro Kumo, and that's because it, I think, has uh, the best example of my, my personal artistic taste on, on kind of this contemporary, modern looking fitting set with interesting metallurgical effects. It's also a very um, very nimble, fun sword. It has a wide profile, but it's light, it moves around. It is really quite uh, similar, or even perhaps more lively than the Motohara LMC blade. Uh, but I haven't used this sword for extensive cutting. I don't know how well it would hold up. I would just say I find it to be a very aesthetically pleasing and a fun sword to move around. It's it's uh, it's quite pretty, and that's why I think it makes this list. Uh, the number one, though, I think would be the Hanwei Kami Katana. I've had a couple of these over the years, and it's just it's a fun sword. I can't say that it's fun to move, which is why I didn't make it necessarily anywhere else on any other list. But you have a lot of features that kind of shows here's what Hanwei is capable of doing. You have a really interesting set of fittings that have the level of casting quality that you find in other Hanwei products in that it's crisp and clean and, and well done. It suffers from all the same other problems. The diamonds can be misshapen, Ito can be loose. Um, but overall, shape-wise, I found it to be pleasant. It also has a relatively long blade with an okasaki and folded steel and horimano, the kind of engraving or the the uh, the kind of sculpture in the blade, not a sculpture. What is it? It's the, the carving out of the blade into an interesting fire god kind of looking thing. And it's just, it's really, really cool looking beyond any of the other stuff that I've seen from Hanwei. Uh, the detail on all of the examples I've had a Wakazashi and a Tanto and a couple different Hanwei Kami Katanas, and every one of them had a, a very detailed uh, engraving on there, which was, was very akin to what you would see in the level of detail on the fittings. I always thought that they were very impressive, and it's just a really cool thing to look at that you can still buy off the shelf today. So I think that kind of goes out in impressive art piece. It's also a very bold thing. It's got this really bright red scabbard on it, and it really is, is quite eye-catching, at least to me. All right, the last list of today is going to just be my favorite swords, things that have stood out to me that are not custom projects, just kind of off-the-shelf swords. Um, and these I'm not limiting myself to, to the rules because I don't want to. Uh, but the, the third place I'm going to do this KC-29. This was a sword that was modified by Josh Marlin of Cottontail Customs. He put a handle on it, I bought it used, and it was just so fun to move around, and I regret all the time selling it. It was uh, I sold it off. Um, thinking that I would, I was, I was still kind of trying to find the right sword at the time, and I sold it, and I regret that quite a bit. It was a very nimble sword. I've had other KC-29 swords. This one was special. The way it was mounted up, how it was balanced, this particular one just had some magic to it, and I, I really liked it. Now, when I say my favorite swords, I mean that KC-29, not all KC-29s from Chris Cutlery. I've had others. This one, this one was what was special. Uh, my number two, the Motohara LMC. I think that is a very fine-feeling sword. I'm looking forward to holding and experiencing some other pieces from Motohara in the coming years. Uh, hopefully other folks at my dojo get them. They're pretty expensive. I don't know that I'll be getting one anytime soon since I have one, but uh, I really, really like the sword. It's it's all-around versatile. It checks all the boxes, and as I noted, and so it, it finds its place at number two on my list. Um, and the, the first one, though, is still my Hanwei Bamboo Mat. And when I say the Hanwei Bamboo Mat, people ask me, do I like the sword? Yes, but I have had seven Hanwei Bamboo Mats now, and none of them are the same. The Bamboo Mat that I have and like is a freak show for two separate reasons. One, it's like nine ounces heavier as a bear blade than most other Hanwei Bamboo Mats. I've got in the 
if you take all this little scatter plot on the different Hanwei bamboo mats that I've had, and plot the distribution and mass and weight and all of these other things that make the sword magic in your hands, mine is the outlier. It doesn't. It do, it's not the same bamboo mat. I've tried to buy a replacement, and there there aren't any. They're just they're all different to the one I have. Uh, by a pretty significant margin, and I, I made a video rambling about it some time ago. I've also customized the sword so it has a handle that's a little smaller, which I prefer despite my giant sausage hands, um, and it's it's made to measurements that I prefer in a style that I really like. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that one is my favorite for all time's sake, but, um, you know, maybe there's there's still room to, to find some, some other magic one. Still, I would say when I say I love the Hanwei Bamboo Mat, I'm on their website kind of stating as much, um, I've tried to buy a second one, and I don't know that the Hanwei bamboo mat I have is one you can go buy. You can go buy a Hanwei bamboo mat, but you can't buy the one I have. It's heavier than most of the other ones are, and I, most of the other bamboo mats, I would say most people would probably prefer the bamboo mat that you can buy today versus mine, which is uh, kind of <laughs> a significant amount heavier than, than most bare blades are. And, uh, and that lends itself to most people's uh, preference. Mine, though, I, I really like the way this one feels, and I... I yeah, so it's just that Hanway Bamboo Mat. All right, I've listed myself out. That's all the lists that I have. But if you have any questions, concerns, comments, or more importantly, if you have a list your own, of your own or would change uh, some position on my list, throw, them, throw that in the commentary down below. It makes for good conversation. Uh, anyway, that's all I have for you. As always, cheers, and thanks for watching.